The super middleweight division in boxing is a very interesting one. Unlike other divisions, it's one that has historically been dominated by Europeans since its inception. That of course has changed in recent years, but when I was growing up, and first getting into boxing, it was generally agreed that the dominant super middleweight champion of that era was Joe Calzaghe. When Calzaghe finally moved up in weight before retiring, there was never really a dominant champion afterwards, and the division has been relatively scattered ever since. On a side note, Canelo Alvarez did become undisputed briefly, but as far as I'm concerned, that situation was entirely manufactured, and long-time viewers of mine know my views on it. One fighter who, after Calzaghe's retirement, I was a big fan of, and genuinely thought had the ability to take over the division, was Calzaghe's rival, and multiple time super middleweight champion Mikkel Kessler from Denmark. Nordic Warrior here, hope you guys are all doing well. Welcome back to my retrospective boxing series. Yeah, I know it's been a while since I did one of these, but I'm back on track now and have several projects in the works for the series. Today we're going to be talking about the Danish former super middleweight champion Mikkel Kessler. It's interesting to me in retrospect how Kessler is very rarely talked about anymore, because at one point in time, he was very well respected and considered a great fighter. But after he retired, like so many others, he seemingly went into obscurity. So Kessler turned professional in 1998 in the light middleweight division, after a limited amateur career. In the early part of his career, he spent the majority of it fighting low-level journeymen in Denmark, and was developing a reputation as a devastating knockout puncher. The first serious test of his career came in the super middleweight division, against the former two-division champion, Dingan Thobella, for the vacant IBA world title. Kessler dominated the fight, winning every single round, winning by a wide unanimous decision. He then took on the veteran American contender Craig Cummings for the vacant WBC international title. Kessler won via third round KO. For his first defense, he took on Costa Rican fringe contender Henry Porras, stopping him in the ninth round. He then took on former middleweight champion Julio Cesar Green, knocking him out in the first round. His final defense of the title came against former Commonwealth champion from South Africa, Andre Theis, stopping him in the 11th round after a dominant performance. He then got a shot at the WBA world title against the champion Manny Siaka. Kessler stopped Siaka in the 7th round after a dominant performance. For his first title defense, he traveled over to Australia to take on the former WBA champion Anthony Mundine, who previously lost his title to Siaka. The fight was fairly competitive in spots with Mundine's speed and lateral movement, giving Kessler some problems. But for the most part, Kessler's size, power, strength, and superior boxing fundamentals had him in control, winning by a wide unanimous decision. After beating Mundine, he returned to Denmark and took on the former WBC champion from Canada, Eric Lucas. Kessler stopped Lucas in the 10th round after a dominant performance. For his next fight, he had the biggest fight of his career yet, taking on the veteran three-time WBC champion Marcus Bayer from Germany in a unification fight. Despite being champion in his third reign, Bayer was considerably past his prime, but still a vastly more experienced and accomplished fighter, and was considered a serious test. Kessler put in one of the best performances of his career. Dominating Bayer from the very start, Kessler knocked Bayer out in the third round. For his first defense as unified champion, Kessler took on the Mexican contender Labrado Andrade. Kessler dominated the entire fight, winning every single round, winning by unanimous decision. After beating Andrade, Kessler travelled over to Wales to take on the undefeated Welsh super middleweight boxing legend, and then WBO world champion Joe Calzaghe in a unification fight. Calzaghe was the slight favourite, but many people going into the fight felt that Kessler, who was considerably bigger, and younger than Joel was a live underdog. The fight was very competitive, with Kessler landing some hard shots here and there, and having some moments of success, but for the most part, Joel's work rate and punch variety, as well as his superior hand speed and lateral movement, was too much for Kessler to handle. Joel Kauzaghi won the fight by a very competitive, but clear unanimous decision, giving Kessler the first defeat of his career. Despite losing to Joe, Kessler gained a lot of new fans from the fight, due to his spirited effort. He returned to Denmark, and the following year, after the titles were vacated by Joe, Kessler got a shot at the vacant WBA title, against the undefeated German-based Kazakh contender and future world champion Dmitry Sartazan. 
Kessler dominated the entire fight and knocked Sartazen out in the 12th round. For his first title defence, he travelled over to Germany and took on the German former European champion Danilo Hausler, knocking him out in the third round. He then returned to Denmark and took on the Venezuelan contender, Guzma Perdomo, stopping him in the fourth round. After beating Perdomo, Kessler agreed to enter the Super 6 World Boxing Classic Tournament for a chance to prove himself as the best fighter in the super middleweight division. For his first fight in the tournament, he travelled over to Oakland, California to take on the undefeated Olympic gold medalist and number one world ranked contender Andre Ward. Kessler was a sizeable favourite to beat Ward despite Ward's home advantage. It turned out to be a complete disaster, in one of the most disgusting displays I have ever seen in boxing. Andre Ward was allowed to headbutt, spoil and foul his way to a stoppage. Ward opened several cuts on Kessler's face, all of which appeared to have been caused by blatant intentional headbutts, a theme that would become very common for the rest of Ward's career. Despite the blatant fouls and cheating from Ward, rather than disqualify him, the highly controversial American referee Jack Reese decided to instead assume the fouls were accidental and suggested to the ringside officials that the fight should instead just go to the scorecards. Ward was ridiculously awarded a wide unanimous decision victory in his hometown, giving Kessler the second official loss of his career. During the fight, Kessler received a serious eye injury that would later hinder the rest of his career. After losing to Ward, Kessler moved on to the next stage of the tournament, moving back to Denmark to take on the undefeated WBC world champion Carl Froch from England. Despite the serious damage and beating that he took from Ward, Kessler was the slight favourite to beat Froch, who himself was schooled and dominated before receiving a hometown decision in his previous fight against the American Andre Durrell, and many people felt that Kessler was the superior boxer of the two. This proved to be the case, Kessler comprehensively outboxed, outworked, and outlanded Froch the majority of the fight, winning by a clear unanimous decision, and becoming world champion for the third time. After beating Froch, Kessler moved on to the next stage of the tournament and was scheduled to fight the American knockout puncher, Alan Green in Denmark. During his training camp, the eye injury from the Ward fight that was exacerbated in the Froch fight resurfaced and Kessler pulled out of the fight. He also pulled out of the tournament and was stripped of the WBC title. There was some speculation at this point that Kessler might retire. Nonetheless, he made a comeback the following year taking on the tough French journeyman Mehdi Bouadler for the vacant WBO European title, stopping him in the 6th round. After beating Bouadler, Kessler was then scheduled to fight the German-based Russian WBO world champion Robert Stieglitz in Denmark later that year. However, injuries and problems during training camp led to Kessler pulling out of the fight on two separate occasions, and the fight ultimately never materialised. This of course once again led to speculations that Kessler might retire, but he insisted he would make a comeback. After almost a year out of the ring, Kessler returned and moved up to the light heavyweight division, rescheduling his fight with Alan Green. In what was almost a shock upset, Kessler was knocked down in the first round for the first time in his career by Green and was badly hurt. Green dominated the first couple of rounds and looked well in control of the fight, with Kessler looking shot to pieces and a shadow of his former self. However, after the first three rounds, Green, who had notoriously poor stamina and a low work rate, started to slow down considerably, and most of the sting from his punches seemed to fade. This gave Kessler confidence as he upped the pressure and landed a huge left hook in the fourth round, knocking Green out. Despite the impressive knockout, it was clear that Kessler's career was soon coming to an end, since he really looked poor in the fight and his punch resistance and reflexes were not what they used to be. Later that year, Kessler moved back down to super middleweight and got a surprise shot at the WBA regular world title against the champion from Ireland, Brian McGee. On a side note, how on earth Brian McGee at that stage of his career was able to win a world title, I have no idea, but I digress. Predictably, Kessler won the fight with relative ease, stopping Brian McGee in the third round with body punches. McGee was notoriously weak to the body and was also knocked out by Lucien Boutte in similar fashion. After beating McGee and becoming world champion for the fourth time, for the final fight of his career, Kessler agreed to travel over to England for a rematch against the now IBF world champion Carl Froch. 
Unlike the first fight, the rematch was very close and competitive throughout, and was an absolute war. Both men were hurt multiple times, and both of them traded bombs till the end. Frotch won the fight by a very close unanimous decision, with one absolutely farcical scorecard from the notoriously corrupt judge Adelaide Bird, giving Frotch almost every round. The other two had Frotch just winning. The fight could have gone either way in my personal opinion, but Frotch was a fair winner. There were several talks over the years of Kessler making a comeback, but injuries and general wear and tear prevented this and Kessler ultimately decided to stay retired. So how good was Mikel Kessler? How would he have done in today's era, or any era besides his own? Let's talk about it. So Kessler, in my opinion, was a very good fighter. He had one of the best chins in the super middleweight division, and he was a fighter that brought a certain amount of physicality to his fights. He was very big for the super middleweight division, and had respectable punching power for what it's worth, as well as a solid jab. But he had some flaws. First of all, he was extremely stiff, and a bit too one-dimensional for my liking. He was a fighter who tended to fight in straight lines with a very predictable pattern, and was just a little bit too basic and pedestrian. He made the most of his physical ability, but without refining his boxing skills a bit, he was never going to beat a guy like Joe Calzaghe. There were certain fights that he could have made easier in my opinion, if he just moved his head a bit more and utilised feints. Despite his flaws though, he had a great career, with good wins over Marcus Bayer, Anthony Mundine, Carl Froch, Manny Siaka, and Labrado Andrade. He certainly had some noteworthy victories, but he never really established himself as the best fighter in the division at any time. There were certain fighters I would have liked to have seen him fight, to see how he would have looked. Certain fighters who I think stylistically would have given him problems. It's a real shame that the Robert Stieglitz fight never happened, because I was hyped about it at the time, and I personally believe that, stylistically, Stieglitz would have been a nightmare for Kessler. I would have also liked to have seen him fight Andre Durrell, Lucien Butte, and Glenn Johnson, as I think they would have all been very great fights. I gave him a good chance to beat them, but I think they would have also been a problem for him stylistically. As far as today's super middleweight division, I mean, it's really weak at the moment, so if Kessler was around at his prime now, then I have absolutely no doubt that he would most likely win against most, if not all, of the top guys. I mean, could you see Canelo or Caleb Plant beating a prime Kessler? I couldn't. Thanks for watching, guys. I really enjoyed making this video. Stay tuned for more retrospective boxing videos. Once again, I certainly have a lot more of them coming to the channel in the near future, and suggestions are always appreciated by me. Thanks for watching, and God bless.